And now, stay tuned for the program that is rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. That Hemsley Affair. A cold, gray blanket of fog caressed the English coast. The village of Hemsley wore it like an ominous shroud. And Sarah Bolton, standing at the window of her home on the crest of the cliff, pulled her shawl closer about her shoulders as she listened to the distant baying of dogs. Minutes later, the sound grew closer, closer. And then she heard the footsteps along the fieldstone path. Hurrying again to the open window, she could see the outlines of a burly, heavily dressed man approaching the house. In the crook of his arm rested a rifle. Sarah trembled at his knock on the door, hesitated, then opened it slightly and peered out. Why, good evening, Constable Harwood. You're so far from the village. What, what brings you out this way? Well, there's no cause for alarm now, Miss Sarah, but there's been a robbery in London this very afternoon. Oh, indeed? The bandit was wounded. We know that. A Bobby's bullet caught him. Well, he's been traced to this neighborhood. No. Just wondered now if you'd heard any noises, seen anyone strange prowling about. No, no, Constable, goodness. No cause for alarm, you see. I must disagree. You alone? Yes. Yes, Enid's gone to the cinema with our boarder, Mr. Pembroke. Oh. Well, he'll no doubt see your sister back safely, Miss Sarah. But you know, you'd best lock up the place. Keep all the doors and the windows tight shut. I will, I will. And stay indoors until your sister and Mr. Pembroke return. Oh, believe me, Constable, I won't stir out of this house. Mercy, no. You watch as the constable walks off down the path, rejoins his men near the front gate. The dogs begin an impatient, annoying baying as they're led off into the night. A shiver runs through you, doesn't it, Sarah? And you tell yourself that you must fix some hot tea at once. In the kitchen, your hand trembles nervously as you go about it. And then as you sit down to drink it, there's a sound at the front of the house. You stiffen, wait nervously, until your sister Enid appears, accompanied by Mr. Pembroke. Sarah, Sarah, have you heard the news? A bandit. He took 10,000 pounds from a bank in London today, and now he's wounded and they're searching for him out here on the cliff. Now, now, Enid, don't upset your sister. It's not pleasant news that a criminal's about. I should say not. Not pleasant. But it's exciting. Oh, you you fixed the tea, Sarah. Uh, Mr. Pembroke, you were saying you were chilly. Yes, that I was. Well, that, that was thoughtful of you, Miss Sarah. Help yourself. Did you enjoy the cinema? Yes, very much. Very much. Um, you hear any sounds about the place, Miss Sarah? Anything unusual? Nothing, nothing at all. Oh, dear, now who could that be? I'll get it, Enid. Yes? Sarah, that you, dearie? Oh, Mrs. McMurtry, how are you? Have you heard, dearie, about the bandit? I mean, right here in Hensley, the constable says, imagine he stole 10,000 pounds. It's only one of the villagers, Mrs. McMurtry, excited, eager to chat about the bandit. You're hardly listening to a word she's saying, Sarah. You let her talk on and on. And finally, you manage to break away from her. And as you return to the kitchen... Oh, Mrs. McMurtry, all excited. She'd have talked to her... Enid, where's Mr. Pembroke? Oh, I I sent him down to the basement to fetch a jar of your marmalade. What? Anything wrong, Sarah? Uh, No. 
No, but but he might have trouble finding it. I I best get down there myself. Oh. Oh, Miss Sarah, where well, you didn't have to come now. Oh, no bother, Mr. Pembroke. Well, I was just about Here, to... Here, not the closet. I'll find the jars for you. Oh, well, now you're, you're very kind, looking after our welfare and appetite. It's this to... cupboard. Oh. Yes, yes, here we are. Oh, yes, uh, fine. Well, back we go, hmm? To the hot tea? After you. Mind the stairs. Ah, well, Miss Sarah's marmalade, crumpets, and tea. Now, what could be more perfect? Ah, I say. Now, suppose... Supposing we found that bandit. Just we three. Ten thousand pounds would be nice now, wouldn't it? Hmm? Oh, you'd have to turn it in, Mr. Pembroke. It's stolen. Oh, <laughs> I'm just supposing, Miss Enid. He's talking, Enid, that's all. And supposing. Certainly, that's all. Oh, but how nice... Ten thousand pounds. That's almost worth the chance the poor chap took. It wasn't. It was wicked. I I hope they catch him. Don't listen to him, Enid. He's saying it all for your benefit. Well, I'm saying it for all our benefits. I've got it all figured out. Yes. A, uh, a shallow grave, Miss Sarah. Plenty of quicklime and whoosh. No trace of the blighter. Quicklime? Does it do that? Oh, beautifully, my dears. Ah, so I've been told. Sarah, make him stop. But wouldn't it take a great deal? Oh, no more than I suggested you ordered to fix that garden bed, Miss Sarah. But, uh, but then we, we, we haven't found the carcass now, have we? Or the ten thousand pounds. I, I'm going to bed. You two are talking dreadfully. Mr. Pembroke's just in a talkative mood. Quite. But only talking, Miss Enid. Please forgive me. Oh, speaking of quicklime in the garden, Mr. Pembroke, you did promise me that you'd... Fix... Yes, I did. That I'd fix it beautifully, but uh, not without the material, Miss Sarah. You'd better get it tomorrow, right? Yes. Yes, I, I'm going into the village in the morning. I, I'll speak to the storekeeper about it. Perfect. Perfect. And your garden will be even more so. Now, in spite of all dreadful warnings, I've simply got to have my evening stroll. I'll not go far, ladies. Not far at all. Good night. <laughs> Well, well, good morning, Miss Zara. What brings you to store today, hmm? We slip up on your order? No, Mr. Hardy was quite correct, thank you. I've come for some quick line. Oh? Our boarder, Mr. Pembroke, suggested it. He's going to be kind enough to renovate the garden soil. Oh, yes, it's excellent for that purpose. Hey, hey, would you like a full bag? I think that would do it nicely, Mr. Hardy. We'll deliver it out this afternoon, Miss Zara. That's fine. Good day. Good day to you, Miss Zara. <laughs> You have other things to do in the village, haven't you, Sarah? And you spend about an hour shopping, browsing. And then upon your return to the house, you're startled at the distinct sound of someone moving about. Downstairs, you hurry quickly to the basement door and stare down in surprise at Mr. Pembroke. What? What are you doing, Mr. Pembroke? Isn't this rather an odd hour for you to be home? Yes. Yes, Miss Sarah. Uh, come down, won't you? I, uh, I think you'll agree to an odd circumstance. Yes. My, uh, my curiosity has simply had the best of me all day. Here. You see? What are they? Uh, cufflinks. I found them last night near the basement door when I returned from my walk. Cufflinks? I, I, I don't understand. Oh, I... don't you? Don't you really, Miss Sarah? Well, here now. Look at the initials. C.L. I'm sure they mean nothing. C.L. Chester Loomis, Miss Sarah. The name of the bandit. Our London bank robber. He of the missing 10,000 pounds. What? Oh, now, please, please, Miss Sarah. You're not the actress you fancy yourself. Come over here, my dear. The closet. No. Yes. I... The one you kept me from opening last night. Now, let's see what we shall see. Hmm? Ah, not marmalade, not even the ten thousand pounds, but quite unmistakably a strange guest. 
Yes, Miss Sarah. It's Chester Loomis, and he is quite dead. I, I don't know a thing about it. I... Oh, come now, Miss Sarah. Chester Loomis, wounded, hiding, crawled into the house and locked himself in your closet? <laughs> Hardly. Now, do tell me, in what neat spot did you hide his loot, the, uh, the 10,000 pounds? Shall we discuss it over tea? Sarah? Now that vacations are over and school days are here again, most of us are settling down to some serious thinking about economy. And economy, that's where Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, shines. Yes, if you've lived out west any length of time, you already know that throughout the Pacific Coast states, from Canada to Mexico, Signal gasoline has an enviable reputation for mileage. But mileage, mind you, is only half of Signal's story, and it's easy to see why. After all, in order to give you such good mileage, today's Signal gasoline has to help your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs efficiently, naturally you also enjoy quick starting, peppy pickup, and smooth, quiet power. More of the things that make driving more pleasure. That's why we say mileage and performance are like birds of a feather. They go together. You're sure of both when you power your car with Signal. The famous Go Farther Gasoline. Well, Sarah, your secret is out in the open, isn't it? At least as far as Mr. Pembroke knowing. And upstairs in the kitchen, you face him across the table. Watch as he sips the tea you made at his insistence. Wonder what he's going to do. Puzzle at the strange smile that moves across his face as he seems to enjoy both the tea and your discomfort. <laughs> it's all right, Sarah. It's perfectly all right. <laughs> Clever of you, you know. What do you intend to do about the matter, Mr. Pembroke? Oh, now, now, don't lose your warmth, my dear girl, your friendly consideration of me. Oh, no. No, indeed. No, it's a simple matter. We're partners now, that's all. Partners? Mm-hmm. We share the secret. The secret of Chester Loomis' demise. And, of course, the 10,000 pounds. You will tell me where you put it now, won't you? I can scarcely do otherwise. That's correct. Now, tell me, how did it come about? Did he just wander in, or did you go out and corral him, Sarah? Last night, early, I heard a sound at the basement door. I investigated. It was Loomis almost done in. You? You finished him off? No, it wasn't necessary. He'd scarcely made it down the basement stairs when he collapsed. I saw the money in a small black bag. Ah. I took it and shoved his body into the closet. Shortly afterwards, before I had time to think, the constable happened by. A stout girl, and you didn't give him a sign? No, I did not. Ah, noble partner. Well, now I'll let you into a little secret, Sarah. Um... Why, why do you suppose poor Chester Loomis picked this particular house? I'm sure I don't know that. No, but I do, my dear. He was no doubt looking for me. Yes, me. <laughs> His old partner. What? Yes, it's your day for surprises, isn't it, Sarah? Oh, yes. Loomis and I used to cook up many a delightful doings together. I've often wondered about you, Mr. Pimple. Mm, but uh, as long as I paid my keep... Hmm? Yes, I'm afraid that was as far as my concern went. Well, that's a good thing for both of us, my dear. We'll do nobly together. Beautifully. Oh, but there's work to be done. Some digging. Hmm? I, I haven't the quick line. It will be along this afternoon. That's fine. Fine. I'll go down to the basement and start the preparations, my dear. Uh, first, <laughs> the uh, shallow grave. Ah, hmm? I wasn't just supposing last night after all. Upstairs, you pace the floor of your room. It's unfortunate, isn't it, Sarah, that Mr. Pembroke made this discovery, that you must share the 10,000 pounds. Of course, he will be a help. You can hear him hard at work all afternoon. You wonder when the quick lime will arrive. You're startled when you receive a phone call from the storekeeper that they're out of quick lime. And it won't be along until tomorrow. 
You hurry down to the basement and tell Mr. Pembroke. Well, no matter. We'll do without, that's all. We'll jolly well do without. Well, you're... You're certain it'll be all right? Oh, of course. It'll have to be all right. Oh, <coughs> it's devilish hard work, this. I could do with a brace on the girl. I don't suppose you'd have a drop about the house, hmm? No. No, I didn't think so. How long before you're finished? Oh, I'd say about another hour. Oh, this stuff's as solid as concrete, nearly. Well, I never ran into anything quite like that before. Wait. Hmm? Listen. Yeah, someone's moving about upstairs. It's Enid. She's back from work. Oh, that time already? Well, we can't go on with this now, that's certain. She's bound to hear. You can finish tonight after she's gone to bed. Better she were out of the house, don't you think? Yes. Yes, all right. I'll see what I can do. It's a simple matter, isn't it, Sarah, to arrange for Enid to be out of the house that night. Dinner over, you ask her to take some sewing work you've been doing for Mrs. McMurtry to her house at the other end of the village. Then when Enid's gone, you hurry upstairs to Mr. Pembroke's room. Coast clear, is it? Yes. You'd better get to work. Yes, in a minute. Um, come in, Sarah. Well? You know, I've been thinking about that money. The 10,000 pounds. You'll get your share. As soon as the job's done. Half. That's what they agreed on, hmm? Yes, half. Good. Are they wanting it tonight? Oh? Yes, that's right. Not that I don't trust you, you understand. It's just that I've been thinking about it, as I said. Rather turning it over in my mind. I, I've been thinking it would be rather a smart move for your Mr. Pembroke to do a bit of traveling, and the sooner the better. Why? Oh, well, I'm the restless type, you might say. And besides, the police are still looking for old Loomis, you know. So? So they traced him to the village here, and that's where the trail ends. Now, they'll have to start wondering about that start checking up on some of his old pals. So I planned on driving up to London tonight as soon as we split the swag. Any objections? No, none at all. As I said, you'll get your share as soon as the work's finished. Yes, I will. Right. Well, I'd better hop to it now, hmm? He's right, isn't he, Sarah? It wouldn't do at all to have the police coming around, asking questions of Mr. Pembroke. Downstairs again in the kitchen, you pace the floor, occasionally stopping to glance out the side window. You can hear him down in the basement, the dull thud of the pickaxe. The minutes drag by, and finally you step to the cupboard, take down a bottle, and pour a drink. Your hand is trembling as you take it downstairs to Mr. Pembroke. Well, 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 what have we here? I thought you might need it. I forgot we had it. Ah. Ah, I could uh, I could do with a spot. Uh, when's the Indian expected? Not for another hour, I'd say. Mrs. McBurtry's a bit of a talker. Oh, good. I will be in the cure by then. Friend Loomis safely tucked away, neat and proper like. Hmm? Everything back in its place. Well, I'll have a go at it again. <laughs> You move slowly, circle around Mr. Pembroke, never taking your eyes off him for a moment as he bends to his work. Finally, your hand comes to rest on the hammer lying on top of an old trunk. Then you're standing directly behind him as he straightens up and stops to mop his brow. You lift the hammer high and then bring it down. This is Sarah, Mrs. McMurtry. May I speak with Enid, please? Of course, dearie. Just a moment. It's for you, Enid, my dear. Uh, yes, Sarah? Enid, Mr. Pembroke's just received a phone call. He's leaving in a few moments for London on business. Oh? Well, I was just thinking I'd drive up with him. I haven't been to London in some time. Yes, of course, Sarah. It would be nice for you. I might do a bit of shopping tomorrow and then come back on the evening train. Go, Sarah. All right. I, I just wanted to be sure you wouldn't mind. No, of course not. Run along. I'll be home in a bit. 
Well, Mr. Pembroke's bringing a car around now. We'll be leaving in a few moments. Have a nice time, dear. I will, Enid. See you tomorrow night. You hurry back down to the cellar. Make certain everything is in order. The old trunks move back over the spot where Mr. Pembroke was digging the grave. The grave he now shares with his old partner in crime, Chester Loomis. Then you slip into your hat and coat. Hurry outside. Slide in behind the wheel of Mr. Pembroke's car. And drive off into the night toward London. <laughs> It's almost midnight when you arrive in London. Abandon Mr. Pembroke's car on a quiet side street. Take a cab and drive across town to a fashionable hotel where you spend a comfortable night. The next day in London is just as you dreamed it would be. The smart shops, the expensive restaurants, the matinee at the Regent Theater. You plan to do it all again, Sarah, many times. And that night, after an exciting day, you board the evening train for Hemsley. It's almost 10.30 when you arrive. And as you approach the house, you're rather startled to see that all the lights are on. Sensing that something is wrong, you hurry up the front steps. Sarah! Oh, Sarah, it's you! What? Sarah, Sarah! I mean it. What is all this? Oh, dear. You don't know what we've been through. We thought you were dead. Dead? Uh, Good evening, Miss Sarah. Why, Constable, what in the world are you doing here? Well, it's about your border, Mr. Pembroke. Only he isn't Mr. Pembroke at all. Mr. Pembroke isn't Mr... Oh, now, what are you talking about, dear? Perhaps I'd better explain. I wish someone would. You see, we got word from the police in London about Mr. Pembroke. Seems he's really a chap named Brooks. Harry Brooks. Gentle Harry, they call him. Gentle Harry? A murderer, Sarah. They say he's killed three women already. What? That's right, Miss Sarah. You see, we got wind of this Harry Brooks several months ago. Scotland Yard asked us to be on the lookout for him. Told us to warn all shopkeepers. Asked them to report all purchases of quicklime made by women. What's that? Usually operates in the same manner. Somehow he gets to be quite chummy with the ladies. Then gets her to buy quick lime for the garden, he always says. Next thing you know, the lady disappears. Quick lime? Now, wait a moment. He asked me to... That's right. And when you ordered it, the storekeeper told us about it right away. Stalled on the delivery. We immediately sent a description of Mr. Pembroke to Scotland Yard. And the answer came back this afternoon. The description of Mr. Pembroke fits gentle Harry Brooks to a T. Oh, how horrible. Then when I came here to warn you... Miss Enid told me you'd gone motoring with Mr. Pembroke. Well, that fit the pattern, you see. All the other ladies went on trips with Mr. Pembroke, too. Only as it turned out, they hadn't gone at all. Oh, I see. When did you see Mr. Pembroke last? Why, uh, uh, when we arrived in London last night. I'd better put in a call to the yard right away. Tell him to keep an eye out for Pembroke up there. That'll be the end of it, as far as we're concerned. Unless he decides to come back. I, I don't think so, Enid. Oh? No, you you know, Constable, he acted rather strangely last evening. Seemed nervous, jittery. Do you suppose he suspected the police were closing in on him? That's possible. Yes, yes, I'm sure of it. I'm sure he did. No, Enid, under the circumstances, I, I don't think we'll ever see gentle Harry Brooks Pembroke again. <laughs> You probably think boiling water is hot. Actually, it's 212 degrees, practically cool as a cucumber, compared with the 2,700 degree temperatures that exist in certain parts of your car's engine. That's heat enough to make ordinary motor oils break down chemically and form harmful varnish that clogs up important engine parts, causing your car to lose pep and power and eat up gasoline and oil. That's why Signal Oil Company brought out Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil, an extra-duty lubricant scientifically engineered to protect your car against varnish troubles. And Signal Premium does this important job in not just one way, but two ways. First, Signal Premium can't break down and form varnish, even under extreme heat. And secondly, 
Signal Premium actually dissolves out harmful varnish that other motor oils may already have deposited. That's why a change to Signal Premium motor oil is today's best way to keep your car's performance up and repair bills down. And, of course, the place to change to this extra-duty signal oil that does so much more than just lubricate is at a signal service station. It's all over now, isn't it, Sarah? And you're certain you're in the clear. The police will be looking for Mr. Pembroke in London, where you told the constable you saw him last. Yes. And they'll never know he's buried in the cellar of your house here in Hemsley. Buried along with Bandit Loomis in the grave he dug. Now your secret is safe. And the money you took from Loomis, the 10,000 pounds stolen from the bank, it's all yours. After the constable has completed his call to London, he joins you and your sister Enid as you walk into the kitchen. And then suddenly a sound reaches your ears. You stop dead in your tracks. Why, what's that? Why, what's the matter, Sarah? That, that noise. It's coming from the cellar. Hey? Oh, oh, I almost forgot about the boys. The boys? What, what do you mean? Well, you see, Miss Sarah, this Pembroke chap, he always disposed of his victims in the same manner. And always in the cellar. Now, when we thought he'd killed you... That's we... the first place the constable thought to look. Why, no, you... That's right. I've had some of my boys digging up your cellar. I hope you don't mind, Miss Sarah. I'll tell them to... Oh, uh, Stan was just coming downstairs to tell you to quit. We found Miss Bolton safe and sound. Oh, what's the matter? Oh, I'm thinking you'd better come down to the city, constable. We just found the body of that Loomis chap. Loomis? Yes, and Pembroke, too. Both of them? That's right, sir, in the same grave. What does it mean, eh? I'm afraid there's only one person who can answer that. How about it, Miss Sarah? Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you, you get so much more pleasure out of driving when you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and don't take chances. That moment you try to save might be your last. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Sarah Selby, and Ben Wright. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Adrian John Doe, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Remember, at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hello.